All right, so uh, I think we're going to try to get started on time today because uh, we only have an hour and we've got a really interesting topic. I want to thank everybody for coming to today's <laughs> Health Policy and Bioethics Consortium. My name is Aaron Kesselheim. I'm a professor of medicine over at the medical school, um, and I help organize these um, Health Policy and Bioethics Consortia um, in collaboration with the Harvard Medical School Center for Bioethics um, and the Petrie Flom Center. And uh, we want to welcome you today to today's uh, conversation about soda taxes and other policy responses to the American obesity epidemic. Um, please settle in and enjoy your slightly healthier than usual lunch. Uh, I don't know if that was for purpose or not, but uh, I think it's definitely noticeable. Um, just to give everybody, uh, if you haven't, you know, we're, so um, I run a group called the Program on Regulation, Therapeutics, and Law, or PORTAL. We're an interdisciplinary research group that focuses on studying um, uh, issues at the intersection of law, therapeutics, and public health. We're based out of uh, Brigham Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School, um, and this is the list of the um, uh, current faculty and fellows uh, who are part of the group. If you are interested in any of these topics, um, we work with many uh, you know, students at, at many different levels, so please uh, let us know. Um, just to give some background, the, the, uh, the goals of today's consortium are to try to, art, or, or the, or the consortium in general, um, are to articulate key issues in the healthcare system and public health that involve ethically challenging policies or practices, um, bring together experts with different perspectives or experiences to consider and propose solutions, um, and just try to stimulate conversation and further academic study of the topic um, to help advance the field. This, uh, this uh, meeting today is part of a series, uh, a consortium series, and I just wanted to give you a little bit of an um, insight into uh, future consortia that are coming up all of these in March, April, and May are going to be held at Harvard Medical School. We're going to talk about uh, funding of drug discovery, um, addiction and addiction policy uh, in April, um, and then uh, addressing the public health crisis at border detention centers in May. Um, please let us know if you're interested in any of these. You can uh, find, um, find us at portalresearch.org um, or find one of us um, that are sitting in the room, and you can get on our, our, our mailing list, and we can uh, let you know about these. So. Um, um, the first thing I want to do is I want to introduce our uh, moderator for the day, Carmel Shakar, who is the uh, executive director of the Petrie Flom Center here at Harvard Law School. She's going to provide a quick introduction of the topic um, and introduce our expert speakers for, um, for the day. And, uh, and that will begin our discussion of um, policy responses to the obesity epidemic uh, before everybody then goes home tonight and gives uh, sweets to whoever they are celebrating Valentine's Day with. Excellent, thanks Aaron. So I'm the executive director of the Petrie Flom Center here at Harvard Law School. We're delighted to host this important topic. Right before we dive into it, just a few plugs. If you think this is cool and interesting, we have some other fantastic events coming up, including we're bringing regulators from all across the world, including countries such as India, Israel, Denmark, the UK to campus to discuss the challenges of regulating artificial intelligence in healthcare. We also have an event coming up looking at the role of medical debt, both in the global context, what's happening in Africa, but also in the US context. So both relevant to the entire world, but may potentially hit close to home. We've also got a whole bunch of research programs. So we're not just fancy events, and especially for the students. If you are interested in doing health policy or bioethics research, come talk to me. I am your person. With that, I want to say a few remarks on this topic. So we've done this consortium for several years, and sometimes the topics are a little bit further away from home. I remember one year where we looked at randomized clinical trials in the context of the Ebola epidemic in Africa. And there may be some people for whom that might be part of their reality in life, although I hope that none of us are stuck in an Ebola epidemic anytime soon. But for most people sitting around this room, I suspect that isn't part of your daily life. But do you know what is part of your daily life? Should I have that soda? Should I have that cookie? How do I navigate my food choices? And I think this is where a really thoughtful exploration of the levers and tools available to help perhaps nudge people, in the words of Cass Sunstein, to choices that might be better for them is really necessary. I think of it in the context of our own events 
couple of years ago, we decided that as a health policy program, we could not possibly serve sodas at our events. And this involved thinking through some of the bioethical principles, such as benevolence. I'm looking out for you guys by not serving sodas. So you will not be tempted. But it also conflicts with some principles such as autonomy. You guys looking around the room, I suspect that you're all adults. I don't really see anybody under the age of 18. And you should be free to make food choices about what you consume or don't consume. And this is why I'm very excited to hear from these two speakers who not only think a lot about what sort of food policies are appropriate, but also work a lot in implementing them. So to introduce them, we first have Steve Gorkmaker, who is a professor of the practice of health sociology at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, where he directs the Health Prevention Research Center on Nutrition and Physical Activity. He also directs the Childhood Obesity Intervention Cost-Effectiveness Study, which has a great acronym, CHOICES that works to identify effective prevention policies and programs that will help more children achieve and maintain a healthy weight and deliver the best results for the dollars invested. So it's both thinking through big theory, but then also what is realistic to implement. We also have Emily Broad-Lieb, who is a clinical professor of law here at Harvard Law School, as well as director of the Harvard Law School Food Law and Policy Clinic and Deputy Director of the Harvard Law School Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation. She is the founder of the Harvard Law School Food Law and Policy Clinic, which is the first law school clinic in the nation devoted to providing clients with legal and policy solutions to address the health, economic, and environmental challenges facing our food system. She has had her work in various outlets that you may have heard of, such as the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Boston Globe, The Guardian, Time, Politico, and The Washington Post. She also founded the Academy of Food Law and Policy and was the founding co-chair of the Academy's Board of Trustees. And so with that, I believe I will turn it over to Steve, who will speak first. Great. Uh, our plan is, I guess, to talk about the 15, 20 minutes apiece, and then leave time so that all of you can ask questions. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Great. Well, I'm going to talk a bit about um, work we've been doing for quite a long period of time. Um, of course, part of the background challenge here is that obesity is increasing, um, and severe obesity in the United States. We had a recent uh, paper that came out in the New England Journal documenting this. Unfortunately, it came out on the same day that the uh, New York Times had a headline that says, impeach. Um, so a lot of people missed it. But it's, it's happening in every state in the United States. Uh, normal weight is declining. Severe obesity is increasing. And this is where we're headed, unless we start to change what we're doing. Um, pretty much the same is happening for kids. Um, we projected, uh, this was a couple years ago, that uh, the majority of today's children will have obesity at age 35. Again, this is where we're headed. If we don't do anything different, um, we live in an obesogenic environment in lots of different ways. Um, of course, well, there are a lot of costs associated with this, and you've heard of this. Uh, lots of excess health care costs, particularly among adults. That's where most of the dollars are. Children with obesity don't cost much extra, but uh, particularly severe obesity in adults um, uh, costs a lot of excess health care dollars. And I actually apologize for having this conversation over lunch. Uh, just go ahead, eat <laughs> all you want. Um, what can we do about this? Well, there is really strong evidence linking um, Increased intake of sugar-sweetened beverages to excess weight gain and future chronic disease. Um, uh, essentially, you know, people, it's um, consuming sugary beverages every day slowly kills you. I know that sounds kind of terrible, but it's kind of the same with cigarettes. In the short run, it doesn't have too much effect, but that excess weight gain does accumulate. The average adult in the United States gains an extra pound a year. Same with kids. For a couple of years, it's not a big deal, but 20, 30, 40 years later, uh, that's called obesity or severe obesity. And note that the research uh, supporting this kind of relationship and 
Um, it's pretty new. I know we did this uh, first study among kids. It was just in 2001. So it hasn't been around a long time. And um, added sugars are mainly found in sugar-sweetened beverages in the US. And all of these, and there's literally a thousand different of these beverages out there in the marketplace. So they're all basically the same thing, uh, sugar water and a little uh, flavoring except the sports uh, drinks, which are sugar, water, a little flavoring, and then a little salt that you don't really need unless you're running a marathon. And I don't really recommend marathons anyway. Um, so this is your uh, US Dietary Guidelines. That's where we want to be, and those uh, little dots there are, are where we're at. I mean, probably most of you know this kind of stuff, but it's, uh, this is where half of our added sugars come from, those sugary beverages. Um, and yes, we do find them all over Harvard, uh, in vending machines, at Harvard events. Uh, some of us just work hard to constantly get rid of them to make it easier for everybody to live a healthier life. And here's your little chart of where the, sugar, um, the added uh, sugars come from. So that's part of the problem. What we've been trying to do is to figure out policies and programs that can improve nutrition, physical activity, reduce that excess weight gain, and at the same time, really calculate out what these different strategies, policies, or programs would cost to implement so that we can find the strategies that can produce the best results for dollars invested. At the same time, we'd like to improve population health and reduce health disparities. And actually, um, a sugary beverage tax on sugar-sweetened beverages is one of those interventions that we believe will do that. Um, so cost effectiveness analysis basically just compares the cost and outcomes of one policy or program intervention with no intervention. That's typically what I'm going to be talking about here. Or you can compare a number of different interventions. And we've done both in our choices study. Um, it provides a framework for thinking about uh, better decision making. One of the interesting things here is that the uh, the economics involved is not very complicated. It's just costing out uh, the different intervention strategies. The hard part, the expensive part, is really figuring out the effectiveness of different strategies and projecting where things are headed. Um, essentially, we'd like to identify um, the lower cost, better outcomes, that right quadrant, um, and also identify those higher cost, worse outcome interventions. We like to say that perhaps the poster child here would be the US healthcare system. We spend more than anybody else in the world and don't do particularly well in terms of outcomes. Um, we'd really like to find these lower cost, better outcomes. And there are actually some interventions that actually might be cost savings. Um, not too many uh, medical interventions are like that. Uh, some vaccines are like that. And we'll talk about a couple here that might fit that. Uh, category. We've developed a micro simulation model that creates a virtual US population so we can model out what the impact would be of strategies where there's good evidence for effectiveness. And um, we've done this uh, for the United States, uh, actually for lots of different states and cities in the United States. Um, it's basically taking the best evidence we have about the impact of interventions and um, figuring out how that would play out over time. There we go. So what we need to do this work is we need to calculate the reach of interventions. Oh, when we study interventions in schools, for example, they're only going to hit just part of the U.S. population. One of the interesting things about a sugary beverage excise tax is it basically affects everybody. Um, we need to know what the effect of the policy or program is, and I'll talk in a minute about our evidence there uh, uh, for kids and adults. And then we need to figure out the cost of implementing such a program. The nice thing about uh, excise taxes is they've been used in a lot of settings already. We have excise taxes on things like gas, on cars, on cigarettes, on fishing gear. So we pretty much know how to implement these programs. And they're not very expensive to implement. Um, an SSB excise tax, and again, this is not a sales tax. Um, it's an excise tax, which the distributors pay. So the 
tax is then reflected right in the price, um, see right in the uh, can. Um, and most of these are volume taxes, like those in Berkeley or Boulder or Seattle or, um, or Philadelphia. <clears throat> um, you can also tax the amount of sugar. I could answer questions about this. We figured out for the US, though, that one based on the amount of sugar is going to have pretty much the same effect. I can t we'll go into that if you want. It basically raises the price. And as the price goes up, people tend to buy less. Um, Price elasticity of demand here is about minus 1.2, um, meaning that if you um, increase the price, people will actually then spend less on this um, because uh, they'll just cut back on what they're buying. And that's what we've seen. Actually, the Philadelphia data shows even a bigger response than that. But this is the same approach that worked well with uh, tobacco. Um, the increase in price is not that great. I mean, a, a one cent an ounce tax would increase the price by about 16 percent, a two cent, maybe 25 percent. Um, the uh, sugary beverage tax in, Me in Mexico is about a 10 percent increase in price. Um, a one percent, a one cent per ounce sugary beverage excise tax in the U.S. for the average person that consumes sugary beverages. That would be a tax of about a dollar a week. So it's not going to break your bank. Um, and for people who are poor, uh, of course, they don't have to buy the beverages. And even um, with the tax, we calculate that they'd be spending less money after the tax than they were beforehand because they're going to buy less. That's the price elasticity of demand. So that's kind of how the tax would work. You just raise the price, people buy less, and therefore uh, consume less. Um, oh, just the evidence on change in sugary beverage intake and change in weight. Uh, for kids, there's beautiful double-blind randomized trial showing that if kids decrease their intake of sugary beverages, they don't gain as much weight. And for adults, we have lots of change and change longitudinal study and some randomized trials. It's, uh, it tends to work. It's not rocket science. Um, with our model, we uh, basically begin with, I'm just going to use this. Maybe the battery's dying. Um, we create a virtual population of the United States based on census data. We take into account everything we know about trends in obesity. That was that recent paper we did where you can predict very precisely where things are headed in every state of the United States. We take into account typical body growth over time and project where things are headed without an intervention. And then we say, what would happen if you actually had a sugary beverage tax in every state? We've done this with a whole bunch of different strategies. I'm going to focus on the sugary beverage excise tax, but it's interesting to compare it with a couple of other interventions, too, because I do think it has kind of the biggest um, impact, a bang for the buck, among a wide range of interventions. We've looked at about 40 different interventions now, published on about uh, I guess 16 of these at this point. Here are a couple of national results where we have a few metrics, the cases of childhood obesity prevented in a given year, the net cost, the healthcare cost saved per dollar invested. This would be a cost effectiveness metric. Um, so a sugary beverage excise tax we calculate would uh, prevent about half a million cases of childhood obesity. In a, I mean, in this case, we're just talking about a given year, 2025. If we look at total cases of obesity prevented adults and kids, it's about two and a half million. Um, we calculate that would save about um, 14 billion dollars in health care costs over those 10 years, mainly because of savings among adults. And it's not really because of weight loss, it's just because we're slowing the rise of excess weight gain. Um, and note that this doesn't include any of the revenue from the tax. That's not included in any of these calculations. So this tax would also produce about $12.5 billion a year that could be used for other health promoting programs or other social programs. Um, the, uh, 
Smart Snacks intervention is part of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. It's an interesting other intervention that takes place in schools. It's a really inexpensive intervention, basically where um, you just cut out junk foods and beverages being sold to kids during the school day outside of lunch, like that school store you may have went to like when you were a kid. Um, it's interesting, the bariatric surgery is a very effective intervention. It drops BMI about 13 and a half BMI units, but people who get bariatric surgery, adolescents, begin with a BMI of 50. So after the intervention, they still have severe obesity. So you haven't prevented any cases of obesity. It could be very important for some people with severe obesity. Only about one or two per thousand kids who are eligible get it. So it doesn't have really any impact on the obesity epidemic per se, um, but it can be important, but it's also kind of expensive. Just an interesting contrast. It's talked about a lot. Um, so a sugary beverage tax, we calculate, saves about $31 for every dollar invested in implementing the tax. This will vary from place to place, uh, depending on the situation. And um, we also calculate, because um, uh, black and Hispanic populations tend to consume more sugary beverages than white non-Hispanic populations, that you're going to see a greater reduction in obesity among those population groups. And in the same way, we'll see a greater, we predict a greater reduction among groups uh, living in low-income households. So the impact of a sugary beverage tax is likely to be to improve uh, population health and reduce health uh, disparities. Um, and as I said before, um, would also raise an additional $12.5 billion a year that could be used for other uh, preventive programs. So in many ways, it's a win-win-win. Um, not one state has implemented this tax. It's, um, of course, opposed by the sugary beverage industry, that industry that keeps on putting those sugary beverages into our environments here, um, everywhere. Um, it's a lot of money. and. Uh, We've been working with a lot of different uh, city and state partners across the United States modeling out the impact of sugary beverage taxes. We've worked with folks in Alaska, Washington, uh, Minnesota, West Virginia, New Hampshire. You can find some of our briefs on our Choices website where we've worked with them. And in Alaska, we modeled out a uh, tax based on volume and on the sugar content, just for contrast. And, uh, Feel free to visit us, and uh, thank you. On to Emily. Okay. Thank you, Steve. That was such a great kickoff. I'm so excited um, to be here. Thank you to the organizers, Carmel and Aaron, for inviting us and putting this together. Um, it's really interesting, I think, to talk about this topic from two different perspectives. So um, I think Steve, as you saw, has an amazing model and amount of expertise on the impact I'm going to actually talk more about the battleground, and if we think these are good, either sugar sweetened beverage taxes, I'll also focus on those. I'll talk about a couple other policies. Where is the rub? What are the, the places where this is really playing out on the ground in states? Um, so uh, Steve talked about this already, so I'm not going to go into so much detail, but <clears throat> we have a really serious health crisis going on that impacts both on the human level and the personal level. Um, you know, people who are ill, who aren't able to enjoy and live long, full lives. On the population level, economically, this is a huge cost. I have some data here. Um, just one data point that always sticks with me is that we now have nearly 10% of Americans suffering from type 2 diabetes, and 50 years ago it was less than 1%. So, I mean, clearly there's something going on that is, you know, a, a, a bad trend. And then in terms of why focusing on sugar, again, you heard a little bit of this already, and sugar and, and sugary sweetened beverages as well. Um, we know Americans on the whole are consuming more sugar than we're recommended to consume by quite a bit. Um, and then nearly 50% of the added sugars in the American diet come from sugar sweetened beverages. So there's, it's like an, an easy focal point um, you know, in terms of where we should put our energy in making a change in diet. Um, we also have a project that's actually similar to Choices, and it's been really fun getting to you know hear from the Choices team and think about um, how we can do things together. Our project 
takes this a little bit differently. We have sites actually apply to us. So we are going to have over three years, eight community partners. Um, we're not actually announcing where they are because a lot of them are really at the precipice of introducing or passing legislation. So we're trying to keep shield them from a lot of the blowback that I'll talk about. Um, <clears throat> so it's really to research and test and help implement policies at the state and local level with either health departments or community organizations that apply to us for this assistance. So they're kind of grounded in what they are really want to do and what they're interested in. We're using that sort of our, our, our sword. So we're helping with them to pass um, and implement proactive policies. On the federal level, in this administration, we've been really focused on a shield. So we're looking at, um, for example, there's now proposals to change the standards for school meals, and we'll be commenting on those and trying to make sure we toe the line a little bit and not worsen policies. <clears throat> and then lastly, we'll be disseminating ideas through a convening and a toolkit. And we'll be having a convening here in April, April 21st and 22nd here at Harvard Law School. Um, the first day will be open to it, it's by application, but open to the public. And then the second day will just be for our partners. And I want to acknowledge members of the ARCS team. There are a couple of folks here um, and some of our students that I see who have worked on this as well. Um, so looking at the policy of sugar sweetened beverage tax, you heard a lot from Steve, and I don't want to duplicate because I have a lot of really legal content to get into. Um, but I think, you know, we know these are examples. Some of these have been passed. So a lot of the examples that I'll give of some of the controversy and pushback are from those places like Philadelphia, Seattle. Um, I don't have on here Cook County, which I will talk about, which is where Chicago is. Um, there was so much pushback that they actually repealed their sugar sweetened beverage tax. And then the goals are really to raise revenue and decrease consumption. And just as one example, um, Philadelphia has seen that they're um, now a couple years in, they've raised um, more than 70 million in revenue per year, which is quite a lot of money to be raising with this. And then in terms of decreased consumption, Again, there's, I think it varies from place to place, but in Berkeley there was one of the studies estimated a 52% drop in consumption, particularly along, among low-income residents. Um, one of the big challenges with these actually is that there are a lot of questions and a lot of our work on, on the site uh, with our partners, who many of whom really think a sugar sweet beverage tax to them would be the gold standard. Um, but it has the most controversy and it requires a lot of thoughtfulness about some of these questions. I'm not going to go through all, but I just want to flag a few. Um, just for the first piece is that a lot of, in particular right now, we've only seen sugar sweetened beverage taxes at the local level. There are some being considered and pending in states, including here in Massachusetts, but there have been none in the U.S. passed at the state level. So we're looking just at localities. One of the biggest challenges that they face is that localities only have the amount of authority given to them by the state government in, in which they reside. So there's a lot of questions about what does that authority allow, um, in particular with tax authority, Sometimes there's, if there's a state tax on certain things, then the local government can't tax the same things. Sometimes they can't pass taxes at all. Um, so there's a lot of questions that come with authority. Um, then there's some questions around uh, you know, who is being taxed. In terms of excise taxes, most of those are levied on the distributor um, that's, that's taking the product to the stores where people will buy it. Of course, as you heard from Steve, that tax gets passed through then um, to consumers ultimately. <clears throat> but some of these questions around where to put that tax. Um, in terms of what products to include and exclude, we've seen a lot of variation in the localities that have passed these around. Are they just on sugar-sweetened beverages? Do they include diet sodas? What about other sweetened drinks and, and you know, sports drinks, things like that? Um, and some of this gets into questions of the evidence, but also of what is, is able to get passed at that time in that locality. What are the conditions look like and what's possible? Um, and then another big one at the bottom, where to put the revenue. So I think one thing that was successful in Philadelphia was that they're using that revenue to plug a gap in early childhood education. And this has been a really big question in a lot of localities, like should the revenue just go into the general fund? Should it go to a specific um, cause that people can rally around? Um, should it go into a fund that helps support uh, more health improving activities? And if so, who will make those decisions? But again, each of these questions I think causes a lot of um, you know, looking around at models, looking at what's allowed in that locality, and these take time to work through, and that's a lot of what we've been doing. So what is the pushback, particular to sugar sweet beverages? So there's um, a huge amount of arguments beforehand. I'll go through a couple. Um, one of the big ones that we hear, not just with this, but I think with a lot of food policies, is 
obesity is a, and diet related disease, di diabetes, like take that as a category of all of these diseases is a complex and multifactorial problem. You can't put the blame on any one food product. Um, so that's, you know, a very common argument. You know, that interferes with individual choice. You heard this at the beginning. You know, where are we taking away your autonomy today by not offering you soda and only offering you bubbly water? Um, you know, a lot of people, there's this nanny state critique um, and that it's regressive. So, you know, you heard a little from Steve. I think the way to think about this is really, you know, most people, it may impact, it may reduce their amount of purchasing of these products. But any tax that is on um, sales or on products is considered regressive because it impacts low-income people and high-income people the same way, unlike other taxes that are based on income rate. So a lot of people will say, well, these taxes are regressive because people who are lower income will be paying a higher percentage of their salary if they, or of their, their assets if they buy these sodas. Um, other big ones are economic. So these are, a lot of the issues have been around, will we lose dollars in our economy? And in fact, Evidence in Philadelphia shows that the Philadelphia sugar sweetened beverage tax has dropped the amount of sodas people are purchasing. A portion of that actually went to increase purchases outside. So I think there was about a 50% drop in soda purchases in Philadelphia. There's a 43% increase in surrounding zip codes. Net, there was a 38% reduction in consumption of sugar sweetened beverages. But you know, you saw some of that money actually went to other communities. So that is a concern that's raised. Um, especially when you're seeing these at the local level. Um, I think that's why there's some excitement around if they're at the state level, you might see a more uniform impact rather than there being winners and losers. And then because of that, people will say this impacts employment. So there's, you know, companies, um, community groups, et cetera, are spending millions of dollars fighting these. And even if you get one passed, as we saw in Cook County, in 2016, they passed a sugar sweetened beverage tax. It was a close vote. It was actually an eight to eight vote on the council. The, the um, board of supervisors president had to be the tiebreaker. And then less than a year later, they actually repealed their sugar sweetened beverage tax because there was such pushback. Just to show some of the pushback, so this was a um, you know, Illinois policy brief about the Cook County tax. The new tax will make soda sold in Chicago among the most expensive in the country. Um, this is from Philadelphia, the Axe the Bev tax. This has been heating up now as there's entering into a new mayoral election. There's a lot of money being spent on candidates who are saying they would repeal the tax. There's, you know, ongoing pushback. Um, and here's some information. Philadelphia's beverage tax, the damaging economic impact. Um, and this one I love, actually, one of our alums just sent me this picture that was taken by the Washington Policy Center. It's at a Costco in Seattle, and it's actually a sign that says, you can buy your sodas here, but if you go to our other locations outside of Seattle, you'll spend less money. And here's how much more your sodas cost here because of the Seattle sugar sweetened beverage tax. So it's really, I mean, a pile on of media, backlash in the stores. I mean, you know, there's a huge amount of pushback on these. And then there's also a lot of litigation. And I'll, let me talk about a couple of the cases related to sugar sweet beverage tax, and then I'll kind of broaden out and talk about, I mean, this is an issue no matter what policy um, communities are pursuing. Um, but these are two cases uh, that, are, that were related to the Philadelphia sugar sweet beverage tax and then the Cook County one. I'm just going to tell you the kind of standard arguments. One of the first ones is that the argument that this, the sales tax is preempted by the state's taxes, that there wasn't enough authority at the local level. Um, I will say, in both of these cases, actually, the ordinances were upheld by the courts, um, but these were the arguments made by industry and other um, you know, local partners. So one was that it was preempted. So in Philadelphia, they said, the state already has a statewide sales tax. The way that the state gives authority to local governments is by saying you can tax anything where we're not already taxing it. And the, you know, they, they said this excise tax on distributors essentially is going to get passed through to consumers who are already paying a sales tax. Um, the court said, well, that may be true, but you're actually taxing two different entities, so we'll uphold it. The other argument that's made in a lot of cases is that it violates the, sh the um, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, the SNAP program, or food stamps, because under the federal law, you're not allowed to charge taxes on um, pr food provided to SNAP recipients. You can't add a tax onto those. Um, and again, they said here that we're not taxing the individuals, we're taxing the distributors. 
and it was upheld. And then lastly, both of the two cases mentioned this uniformity clause, um, which both states and a lot of states have in their constitutions. And the idea is really to make sure that the application of laws is uniform. And um, so the argument was really because these are taxing certain beverages and not others, um, and the, the way that the tax is going to be implemented is not going to end up being uniform. And again, courts in both cases upheld these laws, upheld these taxes, but this cost money for cities to have to defend these. In Philadelphia, it went through several stages of litigation, um, and I think in Cook County, a lot of the discussion of the repeal said this was a major element, um, even though they won, in just showing that there was such strong displeasure with the sugar-sweetened beverage tax. Um, so I want to take the, another two or three minutes just to talk about a couple other policies. I'm not going to go through these in detail, but a lot of our work with our locations is saying, you know, we, we know that you're really interested in a sugar-sweetened beverage tax. The evidence is great, as you heard. Um, we'll help you start thinking about that. But in the meantime, we provide them information about other policies. And I'll flag um, the first two. I put the soda portion caps and warning labels. I'm going to talk a little bit about pushback on those. And then the healthy default. Um, so this is policies that say at, when kids' meals are served, that the default beverage for those meals would be water, milk, or 100% juice rather than a sugar-sweetened beverage or soda. Uh, families could still request that, but it's really putting a thumb on the scale, sort of, we heard earlier about nudges, so putting the nudge in place that, that isn't the type of beverage that we want to give as a standard. So like with the sugar-sweetened beverage tax, we're seeing litigation on all of these. I'm going to go through a couple of these just to mention them. A, a big one is lack of authority, um, so this gets back to the, the Philadelphia case was an, was, was an example of this. Um, New York Statewide Coalition of Hispanic Chambers of Commerce is a case about the soda portion cap in New York City, which was that rule that uh, restaurants couldn't sell beverages that were more than 16 ounces. And one of the main arguments here was also about authority. In that case, it wasn't state versus local authority, but it was that the Board of Health, which passed the ordinance, didn't have enough authority. So city council could have done it, according to the court, um, but that the, there was an exceeding of authority of the Board of Health because they were taking on a policy function that they weren't allowed. Um, I'm not going to talk about this in detail, but another standard theory that's been used is that these are arbitrary because they don't apply uniformly. Um, again, depending on the case, depending on the subject. Um, but I think clogging up the courts with litigation about these ends up being, um, you know, putting a real consideration uh, for localities that are thinking about passing something, whether they really have the time and money and energy to fight against this. And then I want to take a second on this one because this is something else that I think there's been a lot of interest in and a lot of movement globally on different types of warning labels. Um, so this billboard here was an example of a warning label that San Francisco was trying to implement um, and is still trying to implement on, on billboards and advertisements for sugar-sweetened beverage. And it says, warning, drinking beverages with added sugar contributes to obesity, diabetes, and tooth decay. This is a message from the city and county of San Francisco. So this is sort of, to me, is one of the more concerning areas in terms of where the courts are headed. And that's because over the last 50 years, we've seen a huge um, change in the way that courts look at regulation of speech of companies and these kind of required warning labels and disclosures. So in this case, the court struck down this warning label. Um, the main reason in the end was that they said it was too big. It was required to be 20% of the size. They said that that was unconstitutionally um, burdensome, unduly burdensome. Um, so now San Francisco's actually reintroduced it, saying it has to be 10% instead of 20% of the size. Um, the other issue was some of the justices said that this warning wasn't uh, factual and uncontroversial. Um, so if in discussion, people are interested. I can go through why that's meaningful language, but that's part of the test. And a couple of the justices said, well, the FDA allows sugar. If it were unsafe or harmful, why would they allow us to eat it? So therefore, it can't be factual to say that sugar contributes to obesity, <coughs> diabetes, and tooth decay. And at least one judge also didn't like the fact that it said diabetes because it's not literally true with regard to type 1 diabetes. So. In the new warning label, which just passed in San Francisco, it would change it to be 10% instead of 20, to say may contribute instead of contributes to, and to say type 2 diabetes instead of diabetes. I think we'll probably we'll be headed back to court. Uh, we will see what happens. 
Um, and then the last tool just to mention is preemption. And again, I won't go into detail here, but there's been a strong trend. You can see a couple examples here just in the last 10 years of states preempting local activities. These are all the states that are preempting sugar sweetened beverage taxes at the local level. There's been preemption of local regulation of consumer incentive items. So this is sort of saying you can't give out toys with Happy Meals because there's unhealthy food in them. Um, and then preemption of lo any local regulation of portion sizes. Um, so I look forward to the discussion. <laughs> So we are going to open the discussion to questions. There's a microphone in the middle if you want to line up. I will say before we open it to questions, a very polite, loving, gentle reminder that a question usually could use a question mark within the first two sentences you say. If you can't fit that question mark, perhaps you have a comment that you would like to discuss with our speakers after the event, or perhaps you would like to post on our blog, The Bill of Health, if you have something that you'd like to say and share with the broader world. Now, before people line up, I'm going to exercise moderator prerogative to ask a question of our panelists. We've been talking a lot about sugary beverages, but mostly in the soda context. And it occurs to me that, for example, coffee shops are a great way to literally drink your weight in sugar if you're not careful. And perhaps some of the fact that we focus on sodas, not those beverages, is coded in who we think consume sodas versus, say, frappuccinos. Do you think that there are issues of equity along socioeconomic lines or racial lines in terms of what policies communities are willing to implement? Yeah, um, it's pretty easy to include the, um, those added sugars in a sugary beverage tax. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. I mean, I think you're right that we need to be really careful about what it is that these policies are doing. And I think that's why in our work, and I think in choices as well, working really with local communities, getting as many voices to the table early on, a big piece of our project has now, especially after the first year, shifted to getting community meetings on the topic as early as possible with as many members of the public, just to you know, make sure that there's not places where you're unduly, you know, uh, impacting one community versus others. Um, I think this is also a big pushback in some of the litigation has been it's arbitrary to put a tax on beverages with sugar inside, but not beverages that people put sugar in afterwards. And I think a big one kind of piece around that is, is feasibility and implementation. I mean, it's you know, would be really challenging to know how much sugar people are putting in things on their own. In the same way that when you look at regulations around sodium and trying to reduce sodium, you know, a lot of them are more about what is the level in processed foods as more so than, you know, what are people putting in with their salt shaker. So I think that it's a really good question. I think eventually we might need to get there, but I think it's, it's just harder to police and harder to figure out where the cutoff would be. And there are lots of uh, details here. I know when we've worked with a couple of uh, communities, I think in Alaska, the big issue was the, um, um, the uh, beverages that you uh, make from a mix, like Happy Time Lemonade or, or, or Country Time Lemonade, I think, where um, some of the tribal communities there would ship it um, on planes because it's less expensive than shipping lots mm -hmm. of uh, fluid. and. Uh, so we had to create a whole special rate for that because once you add water to it, it becomes bigger anyway. I mean, I mean there are a lot of complexities, but that just indicates why it's so difficult to do policy around food. You know, 100,000 foods in the typical supermarket, 1,000 beverages. It's complicated at the details, but for most of it, it's not very complicated. For most of the sugary beverages, it's pretty simple. I think one of the hardest things is most people don't know what the different sugary beverages are and the fact that all of the sodas, the sports drinks, the fruit drinks, all the range of fruit drinks, stuff that sounds kind of healthy, it's just sugar and water and stuff you don't need. Um, it's not good for you. So the next question is, it occurs to me that there's a lot of parallels between this work and some of the work done around tobacco control. And I was wondering how you see this work being informed by tobacco control as well as how you would 
distinguish some of the challenges and some of the tools and opportunities? I'll make a quick yeah. One quick comment there. I think uh, I think Emily noted before. You know, the FDA um, allows sugar. Will they allow tobacco also? You know, um, a range of things that will slowly kill you. Um, I think it's very helpful to draw on the tobacco um, experience because what really was effective there was first getting marketing of tobacco off of TV. It's amazing that that happened. Then taxing it so people bought less and finally restricting smoking in public places. I remember helping to end smoking at our School of Public Health about 30 years ago. It's great, you know. Um, those three things, I think, really change the landscape in America, and I think you can draw a direct analogy to what we could do with sugary beverages. I, yeah, I think uh, this question in some ways relates back to your previous one in that the food system is more complicated. So in some, there's, there's things we can learn about tobacco regulation. In fact, when you look at the playbook, a lot of the things I talked about, litigation, using the media, using you know community groups and sometimes front groups, um, preemption, all of these things were also part of that playbook. But um, tobacco is easier because it's one product. You're able to sort of say most cigarettes are very similar. There's, it's actually getting more complicated again now with a lot of new products on the market. But, um, but I think that it, it, it makes it easier in some ways to regulate. But I think having gone through that experience, we can see what the playbook was and then how do you push back against that or prepare for it at least. So a reminder to the audience that the floor is open for questions. I know you guys are really packed in, so it might be hard if you're sitting in the middle, but please ask a question. Thank you. I'm Leah Rand, a fellow at Portal. And at the beginning in the introduction, autonomy and issues of autonomy came up. But I was wondering if those are issues that have arisen in the court cases, since we don't usually think that being unable to afford something is an infringement on mm -hmm. my, our autonomy. Like, I'd love to get Tesla my autonomy isn't apparent because I can't. <laughs> yeah, I, it's interesting. I think the autonomy piece is you see play out a lot more in the arguments and the you know the news stories and the pushback. Um, but it's it's not so much a, a piece that plays into the court cases. So I think that the the legal strategy is very much based on you know things like authority, things like is this arbitrary? Which there's some nexus perhaps to sort of say, well, how come? I can get this item but not this other one, or I can buy this and my neighbors can't, or those kinds of things. But there's not really a really like a good legally cognizable way around the authority. Um, the closest is sort of in some of the First Amendment pieces where the earlier cases around this, around protecting companies' abilities to advertise, came from a, an interest in, give, in consumers' ability to get information and saying, if companies can't advertise certain things, and the, the case that was the seminal case in that was around advertising of drug prices. And the, the argument was consumers want to know who's charging what so that they can make the best decision. Um, so again, there was this piece a little bit about thinking about consumers. It's been completely twisted around now to sort of be now companies sometimes even arguing, well, our, um, so we give the highest level of protection in speech to speech that is artistic or political, like things that we really care about. Um, and companies will often now say, our speech is artistic because our advertisements are artistic and they have political messages and we should get the same protection that, you know, this politician or candidate or, or art artist would get. So it's an interesting. Uh, thank you. Uh, Emily mentioned that there was a 52% reduction on the beverages in California, I think you believe? In Berkeley. Berkeley. Uh, do you have any data? Uh, I'm originally from Mexico City, and I know the damage that mm -hmm. the sodas do in Mexico. Any data with the tax they impose in Mexico? Has that been uh, any reductions on yeah, there's actually uh, very nice data showing reductions in sugary beverage intake after the tax. Um, a couple of papers by Arancha Colchero is an economist uh, at INSP. And then uh, based on that data, we just did a cost effectiveness analysis sh showing that the tax there, uh, we project saves $2 for every dollar spent on implementing the tax. It's a much lower level of tax than what you see in the US. but. You saw reductions in sugary beverages and then increases in uh, water sales, actually. Um, well, well, that's mainly for the urban population. Um, less is known about how it's playing out in the rural areas. But it's been pretty successful, and it, it worked uh, just as you would have expected. You raise the price and people buy less. 
question for uh, Emily, thinking of the objections in Cook County and Philadelphia. Is there any evidence anywhere nationwide about potentially rewarding the good agent instead of punishing a bad agent? And I say that because it appears to me that nudges are only efficient while they're present, right? As soon as a paternalistic, uh, whether it's a school or a government, they take that nudge away, people go back to their old behavior. So at the Harvard Dining Hall, we put fruits and apples and bananas by the door students will probably improve their diet, right? But as soon as you go back to putting the cookies and the brownies right by the door, it's not like, oh, well, we've learned our lesson. Like, yeah. we know that this is, as soon as the brownies go back, right, we go back to those. So nudges are only effective while they're present, which corners you in a bit of, like, mm -hmm. a place where legislation is the only solution. But are there any things, like, where uh, the good agent was rewarded and that was successful and cost-effective? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think if there's, like, a good example. But I will say, I'm glad you bring it up because I... Um, at the end was going to take a moment to mention some of the work we're also doing with lo localities is around how do you just think creatively about new policies. So um, some of these policies, like we heard taxes really came from other excise taxes, tobacco, et cetera. But a lot of these were things that were really new the first time they were done, like healthy default. So, you know, requiring that the default beverage not be a sugar sweetened beverage or um, in California where they started saying, happy meals can't come with a toy. So we've been encouraging communities to think creatively. And often it is in the space about, um, could there be some incentives like to restaurants? Like let's say you wanted to reward restaurants that just didn't serve soda anymore. It's not required. We just want to, we, we, we're glad you're doing it. You're making our population healthier. Um, and could you have some sort of tax incentive for them or things like that? So this is the kind of thing we're looking at a little bit. Um, I think um, right now, the only other, I think, model for that is that there are a lot of uh, cities have things like healthy corner store programs that will give um, funding and then often like marketing and sort of, um, you know, like appreciation basically for corner stores that add in more refrigeration so that they can serve more healthy products and, and take away some of the unhealthy ones. I don't know if you can think of other good examples where an incentive to do this is... You, you only know, get a toy with the healthy Happy Meal? Yeah. Right. Probably the biggest uh, change uh, that's been uh, led to dramatic decreases in obesity rates has been the change in the WIC package that happened around 2009. Um, WIC is a program that provides food um, for uh, pregnant uh, women and young children, roughly half of the births in the United States, about 30% of kids, uh, two to four, receive food via WIC. They changed that package to cut the amount of juice. You know, if you look at apple juice, it's, it's basically the same as sugar water. Um, but they cut the amount of juice, um, uh, healthier grains, more fruits and vegetables. Before that package change, obesity was increasing among kids two to four in every state in the United States. And afterwards, you saw declines. It's, it's pretty dramatic. Um, I mean, that's an example of a change that's improved food. and. Uh, it's actually more than a nudge, you know. It's like, I mean, what you were describing, leaving uh, cookies out or uh, bananas, it sounds like it was free food. That's more than a nudge. You're giving people either three, uh, free junk or free good stuff, you know. It's, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So I'm mindful that the time is drawing to a close, so we're going to play my favorite game, which is lightning round of questions. If the three audience members with questions could each say their questions, and then you guys can pick and choose which ones you want to respond to. I want to know whether the de decreases in consumption of sugary sodas or other beverages causes corresponding increases in purchases of diet beverages and whether that's treating, trading one evil for another. Well, there's no evidence that the diet beverages increase weight, so. Yeah. Yeah. Quite. Uh, we're going to hear all the questions and we're going to oh. answer them. Oh, I'm <laughs> Steve, I didn't know understand the rules. The rules. <laughs> Question on the um, model. I assume you're looking at a cost effectiveness from a societal point of view, and I'm wondering if there's a way to tease out who's giving the cost and who's getting the benefit. So for the Philadelphia example, if there's a 38% decrease in consumption, but a $70 million increase in revenue, I wonder who, I mean, again, to the progressive nature of this, who's giving the money and who's, who's getting the benefits. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, aside from industry pushback, are the reasons why the tax isn't higher or maybe that there's outright banned or, <clears throat> or that there's like a, a drinking age for strawberry sweetened beverage. Thank you. 
you answer. You want me to go first? Okay. Yeah, you answer. Um, let's see. So one, I think on the first question on diet soda, I won't speak to the health side of it because there's a public health expert here. But I will say Philadelphia, for example, diet sodas are included in their tax. So I think what, what you see is a reduction in, in sugar sweet beverage and diet sodas, all the things included, and then corresponding increase in water and purchase of other things. Um, now I forget what the other ones were. That was, that's the problem with it. I can answer the second one. Okay, go ahead. You answer the second one. Uh, yes, from a societal perspective. And um, the tax dollars aren't included in the cost effectiveness analysis. Oh, and the last was about... Um, can we go further? Can we? Can the tax be even higher? Um, one thing I want to mention on that actually that's been interesting, and in, I mentioned Massachusetts has introduced a, a sugar sweetened beverage tax, um, and I think it's similar in some ways to what the UK has done. That you mentioned, there's some evidence around. So it's like a tiered approach. So what Massachusetts, the pending bill would do is beverages of 12 ounces with more than 7.5 grams of sugar would have a tax of one cent per ounce, and I think it's two cents per ounce if it's. 30 grams of sugar or more in that beverage. So I think there's one piece which would be a reduction in purchase of both of them, but then also you can end up with some product product reformulation. Um, I do think over time, you know, I, I think there's a lot of pushback on the taxes to begin with, so it's hard to get above one or two cents. Um, and then, you know, I, I think it's, it is a good time to think about, you know, what are the other ways we can, what are the other policies to put in place? I mean, an outright ban I think would be challenging. Um, I, think probably you get pushback. Courts wouldn't like it. So what can we do in between? Yeah. Just one final uh, comment on that thing about the sugar, amount of sugar tax mm -hmm. and reformulation. Typically, the way the reformulation takes place is they add non-caloric sweeteners, meaning artificial sweeteners, as a way of reformulating. And that hasn't been a big hit in this country. So the last thing that <laughs> I would like for our presenters to do is if you had to tweet out one key takeaway that you want the audience to take away from this talk, what would be that tweet? Hmm. Don't bring sugary beverages home. <laughs> Don't bring them home. <laughs> uh, I'd say, you know, I think it's worthwhile to focus on these policies. There's a lot of good impact. Communities need to really think about what they have appetite for and what is appropriate for local conditions. Great, and with that, I would like to thank our two panelists for a really interesting conversation. So thank you. Thank you.